and I'll make it public. Sure. Um, but I'm super excited. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to clap um, and then we're going to record for like 30 seconds just to drown out any background noise mm -hmm. and we'll get at it. So ready if you could just. And hello to anybody listening. I'm really excited. Today I am going to talk to someone that I admire and have become friends with in the last couple of months, uh, Steven Hernandez. And welcome to Basic Brown Nerds slash Build With Joy. I'm really excited for people to get to know you, know more about what you're doing and how they can build with impact in mind. So if you can tell us a little bit about who you are and where you are. Sure, thank you. First of all, so much for inviting me. I know this is something we talked about, I think our initial conversation. So it's, it's been a while. Uh, there's been podcasts along the way through you, which I so appreciate. But again, uh, my name is Steven Hernandez. Uh, um, I'm first generation Mexican, which uh, we're definitely gonna get into. My day job, I work in corporate philanthropy, which is a weird aspect of a weird field of philanthropy in the nonprofit field. And we're going to hopefully talk about that. Uh, before I did all of that, I worked in the nonprofit field for about six or seven years, primarily in the relationship um, in a marriage education field, which is a weird subset of another, <laughs> another weird field. And so uh, in addition to my day job, I still maintain an interest in doing matchmaking, uh, marriage relationship education. So I work as a consultant for a national nonprofit and two or three times a year, sometimes more, I travel around the country. I do uh, workshops for singles, um, which is a lot of fun. I do matchmaking on the side. That's more of a personal interest. And I kind of try to combine all my interests into my YouTube channel, which is Stephen Hernandez's Nonprofit Fundamentals, which is where I discuss really kind of just like the basics, the nuts and bolts about how to enter the obscure, weird path of the nonprofit career, uh, how to get funding, how to run your nonprofit. And then the other side is how to navigate the weird, confusing world of relationships. Like, you know, what are some best practices there in terms of starting, maintaining, or, or starting a new relationship? Uh, so I do, I try to try to do a 50, 50 split of that content on my YouTube channel as well. So there's so many things that we can talk about and I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, so I think it's always funny. You're always trying to match make me. Um, not ready yet. Give me five years. But <laughs> but I think it's really funny because whenever someone just is like, you know, I'm team outsource everything, automate as many things. Um, and whenever people ask me, they're just like, oh, I'm just going to outsource my relationships. I'm always like, I know a guy. And I'm like, not even kidding. And they're just like, wait, what? And that's when they realize like, wait, no, I'm not ready for a relationship. <laughs> And so what's so funny in that, uh, in terms of like a lead generation kind of thing, right? Like a, whether a president's like, you know, I need to buy a new car. I need to, you know, buy new windows. When it comes time where it's like, okay, I have new windows to sell you. Or like, here's the new model of the car that you talked about. People get nervous. And so I find that fascinating. People talk a big game like, oh, I really want to, like, I'm ready to be in love or, you know, I'm ready to be matchmaking. Here's five people that you've described to me that like fit your physical, mental, and spiritual criteria. Well, how do you like it? <laughs> and like that's very jarring to people. So uh, 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 I know we're kind of getting a little ahead of ourselves here, but what I find fascinating about the matchmaking process, and you and your listeners can make of this what you will. In general, men are like all about it because it really removes a lot of it. it. It takes even less effort for them. They're like, oh, that's fine. Like you're gonna present me with a with a you know a selection of attractive women based on the criteria that you already laid out. That sounds that sounds fine for me. So they're they're very fine to get set up. Generally, though, I have found that women, even though they talk about it more, they're more resistant to getting set up. They, there's almost like a shame factor. They feel like that. They feel like like oh, that's kind of embarrassing. Like uh, I don't want to do that. And uh, it's definitely something that it's I observe that I find very interesting. Hmm. That's interesting. I mean, to me, I'm just like, sweet, less effort for me. That also made me realize, I was like, wait, no, like, I'm not ready yet. I was like, if anything, I do want a visa to get out of here. And that's probably it right now. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I would love to know more about, you know, just your upbringing. I know that that was kind of the reason that this got you into everything, too. Yeah. Just, um, you know, you're one of the lucky ones. 
And yeah, if you could share that a little bit more with people listening, like what brought you into nonprofit, but also like your journey to get there from being a little Steven growing up. <laughs> so um, I, I want to back up a, a little bit and something I have thought about more as I've got older as well is that, you know, I, as I said, I'm first generation. I really should say like first and a half generation. Um, because my dad grew up in the village. So like he, central Mexico, he lived there until he was in his mid twenties, uh, early, uh, mid, early mid twenties. My mom's family was from the same village. And especially for, I think for a lot of our first gen uh, uh, listeners, this story will sound very familiar. So my mom was born there, but was raised all of her life in the States. When it came time for her to get married, she talked to her grandparents. And again, this is, I think will sound familiar for a lot of your listeners. Uh, they said, well, there's this nice boy that we know in the village, you know, where we're from. Like, let's, uh, why don't we make an introduction? Because she was, I think my mom was going to visit there anyways. Very correctly, I think she was going to visit some family uh, there in, in, you know, in the old country. And so uh, I, just, I just realized that there, there, there was matchmaking even before I was born that it, um, her parents and her grandparents like facilitated the, the, the meeting between my parents. My great-grandfather on my mother's side and my grandfather on my uh, father's side, they knew each other. And so again, like, like I think for a lot of folks, that kind of village, like literally village uh, kind of mindset of like, oh, well, you know, like we know their family, we, we you know, they're hardworking guys, et cetera, et cetera. That's definitely something that existed then. Um, and that's how my parents met. Uh, uh, apparently my dad was getting over a breakup, uh, which has been alluded to in some of their, their some of their fights and whatnot. Hold on, I have a little visitor here. Uh, who's that? I want to go to the Jason Jaw. Oh, this is my middle son. I was wondering what was that moving yeah, thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, what was I going to say? Oh, so yeah, so, uh, so my, my parents uh, my parents had met uh, at that time. They, they, they were pen pals first uh, for a while. And then uh, when the the time came like for the make from the, for them to kind of make that decision my dad moved into uh, moved to the states but um and this is i think really has influenced my own life my both sides of my family are from the same area as i said from central mexico right and we are my, my wife always gives me a hard time about this and uh, uh Chriselle and i talked about this as well and i think perhaps you can relate to this too is when you see like Mexicans, like in popular culture, it's very much like the Chicano, like Northern um, uh, Tejano kind of like brand of Hispanic. It's very specifically Mexican, very specifically like a California, Texas kind of Mexican. And my dad has told me many times when he came to the States, he couldn't understand them. He didn't like their food. <laughs> he didn't like the way they dress. And like, it's, I remember my grandfather saying how, like, in his eyes, so this is my father's father, like, they were, like, race traitors, essentially, because, like, you know, they had lost against the United States, and, like, so that kind of, like, the kind of Mexicanness that you see expressed in popular culture is not the kind of Mexicanness that I grew up in my family or my own home. We're very clannish, very, like, uh, insular, like, so we're from, like, the mountains, <laughs> So something I heard a lot growing up is um, it, in word and deed was that excessive displays of emotion should be distrusted. I remember my father saying like, you know, like when he would see people like win the lottery or be very upset at a funeral, like so big, big emotions, whether sad or mad or whatnot. My dad would be like, why are people freaking out like that? Like, why do they make fools of themselves? That was the, that was the phrase that he used. And so uh, stoicism, like endurance, these were the qualities that were very much part of my upbringing. Um, and I think like a lot of dads, my dad, you know, came to the States, was a blue collar hero and whatnot. And he always told me and my siblings that he wanted us to, to get college educated. So, you know, my, my, my siblings and I, you know, we went to, we went to school um, we, and we got, blue, we got white collar jobs. And again, I'm sure for a lot of your, the, your, your basic brown nerds network, it's always interesting to me that I try to explain what I do. Uh, and I really struggle to explain what my, my sitting at my desk all day kind of job is to my parents. And they really, it's hard for them to understand. Um, and that very much applies to the relationship work that I do. Um, that 
you know, you hear a lot, like uh, you'll hear a lot of guys that like, you know, like, well, women these days, they can't cook, you know, like they're, they're not traditional like my grandma was. And my retort to that is like, can you break a horse? <laughs> like, you know, my, 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 my father and my, my, my father and my father's father, they were the village blacksmith. That's literally what my grandfather's job was. He was the blacksmith. So he would make horseshoes. He would make gates. Like he, like I had seen my family's like uh, forge and anvil. Okay. My dad knew how to break a horse, how to shoot a gun, how to plow a field, how to literally carve a house out of rough stone, shape it and make a house out of rock. Uh, my father remembers seeing thatched roofs, you know, like where they would weave it like in a very traditional way. He remembers seeing that the village up until he was like not that much younger than us didn't have running water, didn't have power. My dad didn't see like a color TV up until he was like a grown man. Um, so it's always jarring to me. And this is something that I talk a lot about too, uh, in terms of like the career talks that I do, or just, you know, in terms of how we as like, you know, first gen or, you know, second gen people, for so many people who immigrated to the United States, you know, they came from the farm, right? They came to the United States, however way they did that. And then for generations, they were on the farm. And then for generations more, two, three, four, they worked in the factories, they worked in the cities. And now they're starting to move into like the knowledge economy or the white collar economy. That happened to us, to our, to the collective us in one lifetime. My dad came from a place where the houses were made of stone. There was no running water. There was no electricity. They rode horses. And now his, he has Wi-Fi and he has Netflix and, you know, he has access to the internet, you know, and his, his grandchildren, uh, have like touch, touch screen technology that happened to us in one generation. That's crazy. Like, wow, that, I have not thought about it that way. Well, I let me uh, close this door here one second. No worries. And so, why I think that's relevant to my own personal story uh, is that my my dad. I think for a lot of folks, and my my wife is a teacher, which I think I mentioned before. Um, my wife talks a lot about schema, like the, the it's, oh, you know, when, when people talk about like, what, what are, why, why do people like, oh, well, you know, everyone can, you know, apply to college in the United States. You know, we don't stop them from doing that anymore. Spoiler alert. Um, but like, why do black and brown people like struggle to, 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 to get into college or struggle to complete college, right? You know, so many colleges, they thump their chests about their enrollment ratios of black and brown students. What my wife talks a lot about is schema. Like if you as a student don't have, you know, an uncle who's a CPA, uh, uh, an aunt who's a lawyer, a parent who can navigate white collar, white corporate politics, white college, you know, primarily white institution stuff, that's a very jarring and alienating experience for a lot of, um, for a lot of, of our young people. And uh, this is a personal thing for me. I feel we as a community, we do our, our young people a disservice where it's like, well, you got to go Ivy League. you got to go big. You know, like, you know, like, again, that idea of like, you know, we were farm workers, and, you know, and now I'm going to Harvard. Hey, if you can do that. That's fantastic. But that's so much on, on the student. And we're both having visitors. <laughs> that's, so, that's so much on the family because, you know, um, that's such a culture change. That's such a uh, a weight on that person, like where they have to succeed. Because in a very literal sense, their success could change the outcome of their family. And that's just not a pressure that I think their white counterparts really experience or can really even understand. Uh, and again, just as a, on a personal note, that's why the whole college cheating scandal just really, just really boiled my blood. Like that just really upset me at a deep gut level. That, that imposter syndrome that so many uh, uh, black and brown students feel, that's, they shouldn't feel that way, but they do. Um, so my dad really wanted me to, to, to work not with my hands, right? And, uh, you know, something I read once in a book is that our, our parents, our, our parents, our dads especially, their hands were hard, so ours, uh, ours didn't have to be. And I think about that a lot, right? So my dad wanted to, me to be white collar, but he didn't know what that meant. He knew that he, uh, he knew that he wanted me to work, not using my body, but he didn't know what that looked like. Again, that the idea of schema, the idea that 
like I didn't have an uncle who was a CPA. Like I didn't have like people in my community that like, you know, could talk to me about like, okay, you had this interest, you had this skill. Why don't you, well, like, these are some things that you could explore. And so like, I, I, probably uh, thinking back on it now, I took classes that were of interest to me in college. And you know, I completed college, I had a four year degree, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I was done with school. So immediately after graduation, um, I started uh, uh, doing political campaign work. So I, um, uh, so I managed campaigns, uh, ran campaigns at the local and state level. And that I think really set the path of my career in the sense of I got good at it, uh, it's a lot of campaign work. I think you appreciate this, Joy, uh, in terms of your background. It's a lot of very tedious tasks. It's setting up phone banking lists. It's working in Excel. It's uh, organizing volunteers. It's a lot of really kind of like unglamorous, drudgerous work. But what I didn't like about it is that it felt very soulless. It felt very extractive to me. And it's, again, especially coming from, a, you know, like a, a brown community, even then, even in 2006, it was all about like tearing down a person or an idea, even, you know, like, uh, and I didn't like that. I didn't like that, that, that um, kind of plug in, pull energy out into the community, out of a person. Uh, there's a lot of like douchiness, like in terms of like the people that you would work with. Let me temper that because you know, there's some wonderful friends that I made doing that work, but I think you know what I mean. There's, there's folks in any kind of field where like, and they will present themselves as like a campaign rock star. And it's like, really, like this is a very small pond. Really, do you need to present yourself that way? Like, you know, do you need to be lurking around the interns presenting yourself that way? That's creepy. That's, that's creepy. <laughs> but like, you, but that, you, you know, you know what I'm talking about, you, you know? And so I had all these skills, but I didn't like what I was doing. Um, and, you know, I was exhausted after the 2006 campaign. So um, back in 2006, we can still do this. I opened up Craigslist uh, and I looked for nonprofit jobs. Uh, I don't remember why, um, but I, I knew that I wanted to do something different. And lo and behold, I found, uh, I found this nonprofit organization called the Marriage Resource Center. Uh, and it was in the county that I lived and worked in. I was looking for a new job. And essentially what they needed was someone who had my skill set. Um, and when I interviewed with them, I'm like, listen, I can do all these things. You need to get all, you need to get these programs out to the community. I can do the phone banking. I can set up the spreadsheets. I can organize the volunteers. I can do all these things for you. And they couldn't understand why I applied for the job. I'm like, they're like, this is not a campaign job. Like, why would you want this? I'm like, I know. I want to use my skills in a way that, that's closer to my heart. And looking back in terms of my, my own kind of personal upbringing, I was always, I think, the hype man, wig man of my friends. I was always, even like, even like, uh, even though my, my efforts were much more crude back then, um, I was always trying to set people up. Uh, you know, like when my like shy friends, like they like somebody, I would help them like, you know, kind of like strategize. Folks, back in the day, you actually had to call people or, you know, write a note. This is before like AOL Instant Messenger. You know, probably knows what I'm talking about with that. So you actually had to write notes or call people on the phone and, you know, like invite them to a dance and whatnot. So I would help people draft those things. So, you know, we would like plot things out. And we would literally like, you know, like uh, um, work that out. Like, you know, like, like, okay, I'll be her. I'll read her. I'll, this is probably what she's going to say. If she says this, then you would say this. I, I, would, I did that as far back as middle school. And that was always kind of like an interest of mine. But um, as I got older, that I fell into that work and I really developed a passion for it because it took me a while to get married to the person that I wanted to get married married to. So I had that personal struggle. Uh, I saw a lot of divorce and dysfunction in my own per in my own family. And for me, in, on a very small scale, the marriage and relationship work that I do allows me to tackle like sexism, racism. Uh, misogyny, like all the isms that plague our communities and a lot of the other ones I work with. As a marriage relationship educator, I was able to do that because I'm the presenter, right? And so when like, you know, um, the young men, because, you know, they are young men to me now, when they're like, you know, see if problem with women these days, oh, no, let me correct myself. They always say the problem with females these days, which, you know, that's a red flag when they say that. Problem with females. Females. Yeah, the problem with or females. animals. Yeah. <laughs> 
not not baking enough. Like they will literally say that. It's like, well, you know, they don't bake enough. Like that's why that's why marriages in the community are not working. And then my response You're like, do you hunt enough? <laughs> that's that's my response now. It's like, you know, like what was the last thing that you forged <laughs> in your box of the shop? How many bandits have you bandit raids have you driven off from the village? Which apparently was a thing that happened in my family's village, like not too long ago. And so um we can get into that however you want, but like that for me, like on a micro level, allows me to kind of directly challenge those kinds of things. Cause it is jarring to see like, you know, like the infection in the minds of some of the young people that I work with, like you hear, like it's obviously they, they've watched some incel video or some anti-woman video. Can you explain like, what of, incel is for sure. anyone listening? Sure. Uh, so uh, this is, this is becoming uh, more of the thing I'm seeing in the marriage relationship work and the matchmaking work that I do. Uh, incels are in the where that's short for involuntary celibates. Um, and so in a literal sense, it's it's men who like can't find uh, a romantic or, or sexual partner. So at the core of it, that's what it is. It's since like mutated or spawned um, like a whole way of thinking uh, as a reaction to uh, like this, the ongoing struggle for equality uh, between men, uh, men and women. And so they've kind of taken that to the extreme opposite end where uh, men feel that like not only are they superior to women in, in all forms and fashions, but women exist really solely for their sexual gratification, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm probably not going to surprise anyone by saying that a lot of our communities have very rigid gender roles. And, you know, we often forget why those existed. And if you scratch the surface, a lot of those traditions that we had so example of my grandmother, wake up, you know, what I often hear is like, well, my grandmother would wake up every morning and she would get the masa out and she, you know, she would use her matate and she would make fresh tortillas for my, for my grandfather. And, you know, women, the females these days, they don't do that anymore. And that's why marriages are, are collapsing. But the color to that is your grandfather probably rode out on his horse, you know, like, you know, probably did some hunting, plowed the field. Provided income for the entire family. Exactly, exactly. And so there there was a reason those really gender, uh, rigid gender roles existed. Um, and there was, I'm not going to say equality, but there was an understanding of a woman does this and in return she gets this. A man, right. a man does this and in return she gets this. Now, obviously, like those traditions have mutated and have been, you know, used to take advantage of people for, you know, time immemorial. But in 2020, it's comical to me that um, the young people or not so young people are like, well, if, you know, Joy, if you just made more tortillas, or, <laughs> you know, if you just baked more, you would get yourself a man. You're like, well, are you going to support my lifestyle and bring in all of the cash? Because I would probably bring in more than you right now. <laughs> you exactly, know? exactly. And so in my small corner of the world, it doing that kind of work allows me to kind of tackle those kind of issues in a very direct sense. Um, so one of the examples that I always like to use, if, if you did you ever see the movie Frida, the, the one with Sama Hayek? Yeah. A wonderful movie. You know, I recently rewatched it, actually. Well, you, know, you know what I'm about to talk about. So and this, this always goes over in a very interesting way, especially with the Latino community. There's this famous scene by the great, you know, Al, the great Alfred Molina is playing um, uh, her husband. And she, he finds out that she she's had an affair with Trotsky, no less. And he's devastated, devastated in a very dramatic Latino man kind of way. And he's like, it's over, Frida. You've broken my heart. So, something like that. He says something very dramatic. Um, he had cheated on her multiple, multiple, multiple times. But again, in, in a very what simple, her sister, <laughs> what her sister? Uh, spoiler alert, right? Uh, but like for him, that that didn't mean anything. Like you know, there was no there was no emotion behind that. That's okay. Like that's a proper response for a man when he sees an attractive woman. But she hurt his heart. She hurt his feelings. She hurt his pride by doing that. And so when I play that to like a Latino audience, it's always very interesting to see the reaction that people have. Because whether they want to admit it or not, many of us have grown up with those kind of like, I remember very clearly hearing my great grandfather who lived to be 102 and had an enormous influence on my mother's family. Um, he would say things that the man's role is to provide for the family. 
as long as he does that, anything he does outside of the house is his business. And just think about it, think of a gruff Spanish speaking man saying that. So it sounds even like kind of worse when you hear him in, like, in, in Spanish. But that kind of mindset really pervades still in our communities. Uh, and so that for me, that, that drives my marriage and relationship work in terms of how uh, I, I kind of continued on in my nonprofit career. It really was an offshoot of that. So I started, you know, kind of at the ground level, on the community level. Um, and then, and this is an encouragement to anyone who's listening, who's starting your career, something that my father told me that I've always tried to listen to, is whenever there's an opportunity to take a training, do it. So if you have, if they, if they offer a training, take it. So one day, uh, the executive director was like, hey, you can get trained in these programs. Would you like to do that? Sure. You know, and then surprise, uh, black and brown communities are like, oh, there's a black and brown man who's going to do these programs. Yes, we would love him to come. And then I got training in grant writing and, you know, fundraising. And all of that kind of grew organically from me kind of being the person who would raise my hand. It's like, oh, I'll take that training. I'll try that out. But then uh, now I'm transitioning into my current career is I became frustrated with what I, I didn't know what it was called, that I didn't have the word for it, but the, the nonprofit industrial complex. You know, that idea, again, where, um, again, especially for, for black and brown folks, the people who are at literally around the table, who are literally writing the checks, tend not to look like us. The yes, people, I've been a nonprofit and I've been like, I don't yeah. know if you watched Issa Rae. Um, there's like Insecure. Yeah. And yeah, like that has usually been me, right? Where it's just like, we're going to help these people. And then you look around the room and you're like, why am I the only one that looks like the people we're helping? Right. And, it's, and something else that I feel is very important to kind of address. And this is, a, I, this is a, I, I, I feel very strongly is a, is a symptom of colonization or, you know, like white supremacy, however way you want to frame it. Not nonprofit work philanthropy often is a blunt instrument, right? It, it's it's a group of people who are usually white, usually primarily white, and they are genuinely usually trying to do something good, but they're trying to do it in the easiest way possible. And so, what they will often think of is who is a representative? Of, like who who speaks for the Guatemalan community? Well, that's Joy, and, and so then Joy is always asked to be on the panel to always, you know, like, you know, speak at the event for free, uh, it, you know, like maybe sit on the board or whatnot. And so there's, there's like a double edged sword to that, that it's I think, so easy for folks in the community to not want to say no to those opportunities because you do feel, and it's true, you can't influence them in some form or fashion. But again, I think, you know, what I'm talking about when I say it's very easy to be like, well, I speak for the Mexican you know, I'm the representative of, of, of the community. And that's, that's BS. No, you don't. You know, you need to understand that you are a vehicle for white resources and, you know, and you're helping their agenda, which hopefully is good. But that's that's what you're there for, okay? Like, they, they need information from you, which you are then relating to them. And then hopefully the resources they're going to provide, you can kind of like mash it into a, some, somewhat of a usable shape for your community. Like don't don't get don't get confused like that you somehow have power in the community. You do in the sense that like you you can kind of play favorites with the organizations that you like. And that's that starts a whole other mess where like our own organizations start fighting with one another, which I'm sure that you've seen. But it's so easy to get into that mindset of like, oh, like you know, this is all about me. Like I'm I'm a real decision maker in these communities. And it's um that's a very dangerous thing to get into. Um, I did you have a question? No, but I think it's funny because yes, people will then ask you to do things for free, yeah. um, which like I don't have the time for or patience. Yeah. I'm like, you're not paying my therapy bill to deal with your nonsense. <laughs> um, but then I've literally seen, you know, you hear, a, I, I know people that are like, oh, I'm on the board for this, board for that, and all these things to just kind of fluff up their resume. And then you find out like they make no money from that, right? Like it's all about looking cool and like have no actual say in power and just fluffing themselves up. Um, 
which for me, I'm always just like, especially because I'm very ops oriented. I'm like, cool, where does the money flow from? Yep. And also like what actually gets done, right? And then most of the time you realize it's just publicity, right? Like yeah, and people like are clutching at their hearts because like, how dare you, Joy? We're doing a good thing. Yeah. Oh, I've gotten so much like, oh, how dare you not speak at this thing? And I'm like, you gonna pay me? Is this gonna be leads? Like, nah, I don't have time for this, right? Like, and, and this is like, post, so. <laughs> yeah. And I think at the same yeah. time, people are like, but you look so happy and nice and friendly. And I'm like, yes, you see 15 seconds of me, like, right? Well, um, and, and so uh, again, so I'm trying to drop little nuggets of information here yes. for, your, for your listeners. So. Uh, and I know the platform has gone through a lot of changes, but I was an early adopter of LinkedIn, right? And I know, like, you know, it has, it has some issues and whatnot. And we've talked about LinkedIn, influ LinkedIn influencers and how that's a whole thing. But a number of years ago, this is going to be five, six years ago now, I was on LinkedIn and I got a message. And it was from a recruiter from a high level nonprofit recruiting firm. I didn't even know that was a thing, right? For, to back up a little bit further, Again, this is really something I want to stress with uh, to your listeners, especially for those who are early or mid-career, right? No matter what the job is, there is likely some kind of association, forum, group. Like there, if you look, there probably literally is Native American dentists of of, of Greater New York. Or you, you know, uh, or East Asian um, ballet choreographers of Wisconsin. Like it could be something super obscure like that. Because again, that schema, right? Like we often, as a community, don't know. Like you, know, who's the ballet guy in our community? I don't know. I didn't know that the nonprofit career could be a career. I didn't know that was a thing. I just thought it was a job that I had. Right? I didn't think about it as a career. So I really want to stress to your listeners that you can make a career out of this, and there are tiers to that. Unfortunately, the nonprofit industrial complex tends to keep black and brown people on the front lines or maybe in a admin role, and there's definitely not enough of us in a uh, program officer, program management, or certainly not executive director role. So someone who really changed the, 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 the direction of my life, this is gonna be the first story I'm gonna address with this, is and I always love to give a shout out to her name. Her name was a, uh, Amy with Koya Leadership Partners. After you're done with this, I strongly encourage you to check out their website. It's great. Koya Leadership Partners is a non-sponsored post. Uh, Koya Leadership Partners is a high-level headhunter firm for nonprofits. Again, I didn't know that was a thing. Like, I, like I didn't know headhunter thing. Headhunters. There's really headhunters for every industry. I, I used to do advertising operations, yes. and there's organizations that specifically focus on that. And I was like, yeah. I didn't even know that was a thing. And I think that's the other, that's the other cool part, especially yeah. now. Like, there's a niche for everyone, right? Like, and and I I always think of the internet. Like, I went to Rochester Institute of Technology, which is like the mecca of nerds, um, and we had a club for everything, right? Like we had a pancake club, we had a beard club, like we had a knitting club. And I, that's kind of how I think about the internet, right? Like you can find a club essentially with yes. a lot of people yes. for everyone, right? Like yes. that's what basic brown nerds was. I was like, let's get all the like, you know, brown nerds, right? Like all the first gen like POCs, right? Um, but, you know, kind of wrapping things up here, I realized that like almost my 30s. Yeah, yeah. But, um, Really, I, I guess, what are the things that you think people can kind of start exploring, right? That you've been able to translate a lot of your skills, right? And that's, I think, something that people don't realize, that you can always transfer your knowledge and skill sets to a new career. And what are kind of the steps that you would recommend for folks to start looking into to just explore different options? That's a great question. Uh, so one of the things that I feel even now in 2020, like in Zoom, everything is a public speaking skills. Like no, no matter what you do, it, it's fascinating to me how many high level people in like corporate America are terrified, like peeing their pants, terrified of like, oh, I gotta make this presentation. It's gonna be five minutes long, okay? And, and like, they're really nervous to do it. So anyone who, it, you don't have to be good at it. You have to be comfortable doing that. I wanna say that again. You don't necessarily have to be good at it, but you have to be comfortable doing public presentations. And that is something that everybody can learn because people are terrified of doing it. And if you can help them, 
you know, you always have a job. Um, I'm definitely not good at this yet, but like this is definitely something that, again, retroactively, I wish I would have. I'm learning now is like basic, you know, database Excel access stuff. I'm learning that on the job. Again, 2020, everyone is somehow connected to the knowledge economy. Something that I, I really stress with people, especially if you're in the corporate environment, you have to understand that you're in a pyramid scheme, if you will, where your boss needs to make a presentation of 20 minutes to their boss, who needs to make a presentation of 10 minutes to their boss, who needs to make a presentation of five minutes to their boss, which means you need numbers, you need a bullet point, and you need someone to kind of uh, uh, deliver that in a very succinct way, okay? Which means you need to be able to provide graphics, a uh, data point. We did 20% more of X, Y, Z. And this is why it's super important. That's Excel work, that's PowerPoint presentations, that's being able to deliver things in a dynamic way. Because your boss needs to look good in front of their boss. Your, their boss needs to be able to present those numbers to their boss, who needs to present to the CEO, so the CEO can say, we're doing excellent at X, Y, and Z. That's literally all that I've got. Like, and it takes hours to do, and they don't care, they just want the last product. They're like, can you make that blue? And I'm like, yes. I hate yes. Yes. You know, like, that equation took me like three weeks to yeah, build exactly. and, and analyze, but here's yes. pretty visuals. It, it, it's terrible to say, but yes, they generally don't care about the the analysis. They need to know, like I'm having to do that, like break down like our giving in like a certain state. And it was like, don't you care about like the the ratios of what we gave to? No, like it, it's it, it was gray and red and they didn't like that. Like it was a template they were using where I, could, I couldn't change the colors and whatnot. So you could always be indispensable in the sense of if you're able to translate data or information into a way that is consumable in little bites. That doesn't mean you have to be a data person. That means that you can absorb information and extract something that's valuable out of it. Um, networking, I, I know there's been a lot of conversation amongst, uh, like I think, black, black and brown folks, how like icky that feels. And I think you and I have like different, like, <laughs> different thoughts on this where I am very much like all about like accosting people. Like I don't mind doing that. When I decided I want to get into philanthropy, it's a very niche field. That's a very white field. I was okay because someone told me like, cause I would ask, I would literally go to conferences with the express purpose of going to people who had the job that I wanted. So I really want to emphasize and if we end with this, I think this will be fine. Whatever your job is literally develop the thick skin to be like, Joy, you're who I want to be. I want to be Joy 10 years from now. What did you do to become Joy? You know, and that I would literally find people who were pro officers who were, who were doing the jobs that I wanted to do. And I would ask them, did you go to school for this? Like, is like, what's on your resume? And they were like, like, don't go to school for this. Like, I met a program officer who was like a music professor or someone was like a math teacher. You would, you always assume that like there's a linear path to what you want to do. And that's often not the case. Um, the most valuable piece of advice they gave me is that you may for a while have to work for free strategically to build the experience to do what you want to do, but you have to be strategic about that. Yes. Like, I that was a cut to do what I did. Yeah. Yeah. But they're always towards a path of doing something. So for me, I served on a board because I wanted grant review experience. I did grant review stuff because I want to get on, on the back end of that. I currently serve on an impact investing board because I want to learn more about that. I'm building myself up, not in a fluffy way, to your point earlier. That's not a fluffy way. I'm building my skills and I'm delivering something back to my community. Every time I do a marriage and relationship workshop thing, I'm practicing my, my public speaking skills. I'm traveling around the country. I'm making more connections. And I'm setting people up too. So <laughs> I'm checking out a lot of boxes for myself. But when you tell people, I travel around the country delivering workshops, that's, an, that's a weird, impressive thing about you that tells people you don't mind traveling and you certainly don't mind speaking in front of a group of strangers. And so my bosses will be like, I don't want to do this presentation. You do it. Okay. Right. That makes you invaluable. <laughs> And it makes you valuable. Make yourself valuable in a way that brings value to you. Yes. You oh, I love that. And so I feel like you've dropped so many amazing nuggets that people can find. Where can they find you specifically and reach out if they have any questions? 
Well, I know you're always giving me a hard time about like integrating my stuff, but <laughs> you're gonna work on your branding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The the main place where they can find my, if you will, my lectures and my resources is my YouTube channel. So that's Stephen Hernandez's nonprofit fundamentals on YouTube. And we'll have all the links everywhere. Yeah, so I have my playlist of like all my nonprofit stuff, all my relationship stuff. I have my, I have my Instagram, and where I'm always spamming out resources and jobs because that's a that's a big thing for me. I'm Stephen Hernandez, 875 on Instagram. But uh, I would really love for people to, to engage with me more on YouTube. Uh, like I have things about how to find a job, uh, red flags and relationships, uh, how to raise money for your nonprofit, how to build a community outreach program, all the things that I've learned in, in my career, I try to put it out there in a basic kind of one-on-one kind of way. And if you like have a comment or question, I will do my best to answer. Because like, you know, these resources are not, are by design, not out there and not accessible. So I'm trying to make them accessible specifically for the communities that we come from. And are you connecting with folks on Twitter? I know that's where you're always tagging everyone. <laughs> yeah, I do I do that all, all over as well. So, uh, so people can find me there at uh, SJ Hernan, so SJ Hernan 360, uh, 3060, I should say. So SJ Hernan 3060, like again, all my things are kind of separated. They're not integrated particularly well. <laughs> But uh, I, I do my best to respond. I love it when people have like specific questions for me. So sometimes people will say, like uh, someone had asked me, like do a, do a video on colorism in relationships. So I did that in terms of this specific Hispanic context. And through that, I was able to link to other people who have given me knowledge on other social media, some of the people that I connected with through you um, about how colorism came, uh, you know, uh, has come and affected our relationships as well people who run nonprofits, they always ask kind of generally the same question. So I have a video for that. Like, you know, if you're starting a nonprofit, how do you fund that? How do you build your board? What are the things that you need to do to be successful? And I have a bunch of playlists for that. And you can check all those out. And, you know, if you have a specific question, I would do my best to respond. Yay! Well, thank you so much for this, Stephen. I'm really excited that we finally got to do this. Yes, thank and you so much. And exciting for everything else to come. Right.